Jair Bolsonaro has taken office as the new president of Brazil. Bolsonaro arrived to the parliament in capital Brasilia where he took oath. After the swearing-in ceremony, Bolsonaro met Michel Temer, who handed him the presidential sash. I pledge to defend and respect the Constitution, to observe the laws, to promote the general good of the Brazilian people, to defend the unity, integrity and independence of Brazil. The new Brazilian president has addressed the parliament on his inauguration day. He talked economy and also about the family values, saying he will fight against the ideology of gender. I take this solemn moment to call all deputies to help me in this mission of restoration and recovery of the homeland by finally freeing it from the yoke of corruption, criminality, economic responsibility and ideological submission. We will unite the people, value the family, respect religions and our Judeo-Christian traditions, fight the ideology of gender while preserving our values. Brazil will once again become a country free of ideological chains. Bolsonaro arrived to Parliament in a luxury car accompanied by his wife, Michelle Bolsonaro. Thousands of people gathered around Congress to support the new president among heavy security. Bolsonaro and his wife paraded through the Esplanade do Ministerio Avenue before arriving to Parliament. And at the same time, Bolsonaro was taking oath, hundreds of people gathered outside the police headquarters in Curitiba, where former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva is being held. Supporters threw balloons and flowers in support of the former president. Severe, several, several leaders from left-wing parties attended the gathering to reject the inauguration. They said they are meeting to discuss strategies to fight against the rise of fascism in Brazil. For me, Bolsonaro's inauguration means that the election was a farce, it was a fraud. They barred the candidate who was leading. And this was done by a justice system that is completely purchased. This is a moment when we have to return to our origins. We have to strengthen our bases. It is a period of dialogue in which we have to explain to society what is happening. But more than anything, we have to stay united and strong. Our correspondent Brian Mir brings us up to date from Curitiba. I'm here in Curitiba, where at the stroke of 3 p.m. in front of the federal police headquarters where Luis Inácio Lula da Silva is being held prisoner, hundreds of people launched red balloons and started chanting, Free Lula, Free Lula. And then the women in the group started throwing flowers over the police station gates. As you can hear now, it's very noisy. They're beginning to sing. But as the PT party has boycotted Jair Bolsonaro's inauguration in Brasilia, Curitiba, specifically in front of where Lula's been held prisoner, has become the focal point for the Brazilian left today. Curitiba, Brian Mir, Telesur. And just hours before the surrender of Bolsonaro, supporters of Brazil's Workers' Party gathered outside the police headquarters in Curitiba, where Lula was being held. As midnight struck, they chanted, Happy New Year, Free Lula. More in this report. A local judge denied Luis Inácio Lula da Silva his right to receive family visits over the New Year's holiday. But thousands of union and social movement activists traveled from across Brazil to wish a Happy New Year to the former president. They joined the activists, who have been camped out in front of the federal police headquarters in Curitiba, where Lula has been held in solitary confinement as a political prisoner since April 7th. By the time the sun set, after the traditional good night shout to Lula, there were thousands of people in the camp. There were musical and theater performances, and Lula's New Year's greeting to the Brazilian people was read to the crowd by PT President Senator Glazy Hoffman. We will not lower our heads and let them take away our happiness to be alive and fight for better days. Tomorrow will be another day, he said. Our social movement has been here since the day Lula was arrested. We can let him feel alone for one second. So we set up the camp the first day he arrived here. There were a lot of people here, and we rotate and people come. So the resistance in solidarity with President Lula is forever. We will only live here the day he gets out. I came here to give solidarity to Comrade Lula, who is a political prisoner and an example of resistance for the Brazilian workers and for building a better world. 
As long as he's held here, we will stay at his side, maintaining the resistance, maintaining our indignation, and maintaining our capacity to fight. As midnight approached, the crowd assembled as close to the window of Lula's cell as they could get. The activists held flowers and turned their cell phone lights on and yelled Happy New Year's to Lula 13 times. Brian Mir, Telesur, Curitiba. The Cuban Revolution, one of the most important events of the 20th century in Latin America, is marking its 60th anniversary. Those who experienced it will never forget the triumph march of those bearded revolutionaries who came down from the Sierra Maestra and for seven days crossed the length of the island. Jose Alberto Leon was 22 in January 1959. For his achievements as a fighter in the rebel army, he was chosen as part of Fidel Castro's security detail during the Freedom Caravan. What he experienced then, he can never forget. Sixty years have passed and the memory still takes his breath away. I found myself at the side of Fidel. In the midst of all that attention and thanks to that, people were showering on him, shouting for him, kissing him, throwing flowers, bringing their children. A whole multitude never heard before. I was very moved. They say it was the biggest show of public enthusiasm in the history of Cuba. For a week, over more than a thousand kilometers, people turned out to see their heroes pass by. At this time of triumph, I recall the heroes who have fallen and give my deep, heartfelt thanks to the people of Cuba who are today an example and the pride of the Americas. Witnesses say that the images that survive don't do justice to the scale of what happened. Everyone wanted to see him riding on a tank seized from the dictatorship. Nobody wanted to miss the chance of seeing the man, who was already a legend. In, in town after town, Fidel spoke directly to the people, in the direct language they understood. Since the people are now in charge, we need a new style. We no longer come to speak to the people, but for the people to speak to us. From now on, it is the people who must speak, the people who must rule, the people who must make the laws. They say that Fidel Castro's entry into Havana was like something nobody could have imagined. Bells tolled, car horns blew, boats sounded their sirens, shops and offices emptied everywhere, the crowds were waiting. It was a climax to end all climaxes. Fidel spoke to the people of Havana from the spot where the dictatorship stationed its best troops. I believe that at this decisive moment of our history, the tyranny has been overthrown, the joy is unbounded, and yet there is still so much to be done. Let's not fool ourselves that now everything will be easy. Maybe now everything will be a lot more difficult. Fidel called for peace and revolutionary unity. Soon there would be land reform, the literacy campaign with barracks turned into schools, and the nationalizations. It was the beginning of a new era. A new Cuba was being born. The Chinese president has congratulated Cuba on the 60th anniversary of the revolution victory. Xi Jinping said that the Cuban Communist Party and its people are improving the nation's socialist system and that they have made great achievements. He also mentioned President Miguel Diaz Canel historic visit to China a month ago in which they agreed to strengthen ties. And Russian President Vladimir Putin has called for unity in a televised New Year's address. Putin highlighted problems in the economy, healthcare and technology sectors, as well as others, and stressed that a brighter future will only be possible through a collective effort. The address aired to Russia's Far East regions before midnight. The New Year is a universal celebration enjoyed by people all over the world. So let's take a look and see how different cultures celebrate it. After nearly eight years of war, the streets of Damascus came to life with Syrians in their droves from all religious backgrounds and joined the facilities. The markets were adorned with colorful decorations and lights as people soaked up the atmosphere. In addition to a traditional fireworks display, Syrian culture was fully on display as people danced to traditional music. 
China, the Olympic Park was transformed into an extravagant spectacle complete with dancing, skating and sculpting, where its native giant panda bear was present too. The show was also part of the opening ceremony of Beijing's Ice and Snow Cultural Tourism Festival to mark the hosting of the 2022 Winter Olympics. Artist Huang Jiang made the Olympic-themed sculpture, explains her vision behind the creation. My sculpture is about the athletes dancing together and going towards a bright future. I wish the Winter Olympics will achieve a great success and everybody has a great new year. And in Jakarta, Indonesia, hundreds of couples tied the knot in annual New Year's mass wedding. Around 900 couples got married in a ceremony funded by the government. People on low income are those who cannot provide official documents qualified for the event. Couples wore traditional Indonesian clothes and accessories for their big day. We'll take a short break now. Join us in a few. Welcome back. It is exactly 25 years since the Zapatista National Liberation Army appeared in Mexico. The indigenous organization shook the country and became one of Latin America's most important social movements. The group promotes the revolutionary ideals of land and liberty and has developed roots throughout Mexico. The indigenous the uprising, carefully prepared for more than 10 years in depth of southern Mexico, took the pre-government by surprise on January 1, 1994. Two months after it first emerged, the Zapatista army began talks with the government. We have come with truth and honesty. If there is another way of reaching this point, where this flag flies with democracy, freedom and justice, show it to us. With the betrayal of the San Andres Agreements, in which the government promised to recognize indigenous autonomy and self-determination, the ECLN withdrew from the talks, but it pressed on with its agitation and propaganda until 2001. The Zapatista march ended with an appearance before Congress. There is the country we want, where differences are respected, where living and thinking differently are not a reason to be sent to prison, persecuted or killed. While the Zapatistas continued to organize in autonomous communities, they made clear their distrust of elections through their other campaign. The decomposition of the republic and its values is such that only radical measures can correct this, measures that do not appear in any government program. The Zapatistas, through peaceful means, had a huge impact on Mexico, especially on civil society. They showed the younger generation that it was worth struggling, that it was possible to change the course of history, which had not ended, that freedom was possible. In the so-called shells, the Zapatistas gave an example of self-government and autonomy, open for all to visit and learn from, through the Zapatista schools. They also developed an organization to carry their ideals beyond the hills of Chiapas, the Indigenous Government Council, or CIG. It's made up equally of men and women, and is present in all areas, carrying on the struggle against capitalist corporations. It was out of the CIG that came Maria de Jesus Patricio. She is a traditional indigenous doctor and became a pre-candidate for the 2018 presidential election. She didn't get enough signatures to appear on the ballot, but she showed that the Zapatistas' principles remained relevant. There is only one way to overthrow the capitalist system, and those who have seized everything, who have the money and the power, and that is organization. We see no other way. We have to begin to trust in what we have. 25 years after the San Cristobal uprising, the Zapatista and indigenous role in Mexican political life continues to inspire and educate the younger generations. The Peruvian attorney general has dismissed two prosecutors who were investigating the Odebrecht case. Pedro Chavarri dismissed the coordinator Rafael Varela and the prosecutor Jose Domingo Perez. Both were in charge of investigating the opposition leader Keiko Fujimori and four former presidents allegedly involved in the corruption scandal. Domingo Perez had accused Chavarri of blocking the investigations against Fujimori. <laughs> 2018 kicked off with a great achievement for the LGBTI community. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights ruled in favor of equal marriage in January. But as the year passed, there have been highs and lows for queer people. 
Taiwan gave a late setback to the LGBTI community as it limited the definition of marriage to a man and a woman, evidence of the lack of equal rights for the gay community, even in one of the most open-minded societies in Asia. On November 24th, voters blocked same-sex marriage. The result shows that all the progressive issues are being counter-attacked by conservative powers during the first year of referendums in Taiwan. We also see clearly that this society still has a long way to go before it can enter a stage of rational thinking. With regret and sorrow, we want to tell the people that these absurd and ridiculous referendums were unconstitutional from the start, and now they also end illegally as well. But this major blow in 2018 may be compensated with other positive news. In India, the highest court decriminalized homosexuality in November, an historic ruling in the second most populous country in the world. On the other side of the world, in Chile, Congress passed a law in September allowing trans people to officially change their name and gender identity. A milestone for the trans community, as it also includes people as young as 14. This is an opportunity. We, transgender people, have struggled a lot to achieve this. The truth is, there are still huge disparities in the rights and acceptance afforded to LGBTI people across the world. There are big differences in the recognition of rights for LGBTI people across the world. Being queer is still illegal in the majority of African countries, with the exception of South Africa, which recognizes same-sex marriage. Penalties also exist in many countries in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, although often these are not applied. However, in parts of the Middle East, even the death penalty can apply. In Latin America, homosexuality is not illegal, but it is still one of the most dangerous regions for the LGBTI community, especially for trans people. Same-sex marriage is recognized in Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Colombia, and some Mexican states, whilst in Ecuador and Chile, gay couples can establish civil unions. Bolivia allows marriage in the case of trans people, and Costa Rica is set to legalize equal marriage before 2020. But despite the oppression, threats, and discrimination, a wave of pressure for progressive change and tolerance is growing in many of the restricted countries. Civil society is rising to demand basic equal rights. The Kenyan film Rafiki managed to break through the country's taboo on lesbian love. Banned for several months, it was broadcast for the first time in Nairobi in September after winning international recognition and awards. We need to take cognizance of the fact that the LGBTQ issue is real. And in as much as we are trying to run away from it, it's real. It's important that um, we accept, as they say in politics, accept and move on. And so I felt very bad when we shy away or we bury our heads in the sand like ostriches when these situations are actually happening. In Ecuador, the judiciary recognized in May the right of a lesbian couple to register their daughter with both mothers' names, a milestone in a deeply conservative country. What makes me so happy, really, is that the decision was not just for us. It's more than I expected. But the rise of the far right and semi-fascist movement put the LGBTI community on alert. Now religion is not the only obstacle. Homophobic views are entering national parliament across the world. So I think the coming year, 2019, will see us look towards resistance. When I say resistance, it's not about militarism or anything like that. It's about resisting in order to keep on existing, to keep the discussions alive. 2018 has been a year of contrast for the LGBTI community. Next year, the struggle will continue, because love is love as the LGBTI community always insists, no matter in what form. Hey! I'll be back very soon, stay with us.
Welcome back. Electoral authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo have collected voting material from polling stations in the Goma region for its county. The country went to the polls on December 30th for an election that has been delayed three times since 2016. Violence was not reporting on voting day. The country has never had a peaceful transition of power since it gained independence from Belgium in 1960. And at least eight people have died and dozens remain trapped after a residential building collapsed in Russia due to a gas explosion. Rescuers are looking for at least 40 people trapped. A baby was among the survivors. The explosion collapsed a great section of the building. There was a bang, as if something had blown up in the street. My husband went downstairs, then returned and said to get ready quickly as our building had collapsed. Three people have been injured after a man stabbed them in Manchester in a train station on New Year's Eve. Police said they are treating the event as a terror attack among the victims, where a woman and a man in their 50s and a male police officer. Police said they will reinforce their presence in the city that was hit by a suicide bomb attack in 2017 that killed 22 people. Last night we experienced a horrific attack on people simply out to enjoy the New Year's Eve celebrations in Manchester. My thoughts are very much with the couple who are still being treated in hospital for their very serious injuries and of course with the brave British transport police officer uh, that was stabbed during the attack. I know that the events of last night will have affected many people and caused concern particularly as the incident happened so close to the scene of the terrorist attack on the 22nd of May 2017. The United States and Israel have formally quit UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Agency. The administration of U.S. President Donald Trump announced its withdrawal in October 2017 following Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Both countries accused the UN organization of being Israeli biased. The UNESCO have previously criticized the Israeli occupation of Jerusalem and granted Palestine membership in 2011. And finally, people in Germany can now legally identify themselves as a third gender thanks to a law that has come into effect on the first day of 2019. Official documents will now include a third diverse category together with the option of male and female. Some LGBT organizations say the measure is insufficient as people choosing the third option will need a doctor's certificate to register. Intersexual people do not clearly identify with any gender from a psychological and an autonomical point of view. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Tres for English, my name is Stephanie Bravo. Thank you for watching.